エドワード・スノーデンさんです Thank you so much for joining us early in the morning.、Um, you are in your fifth year in Russia. Tell me a little bit about your life. I'm still in my fourth. You're still in your fourth? Soon. Soon. It'll be. Okay, sorry about that.、Um, what, what is your life like now? What is your primary interest? In, what, what is it like? Living in Moscow?、Uh, the work for reform is the primary part of my life now. Everybody asks、uh, sort of how are things in Russia,、uh, but the reality is I live a much more global life than that, as we see today.、Uh, my day to day、uh, involves working with organizations across borders、uh, that don't really see、uh, lines and flags. So much as they see the, the court issues. Now I work as the Freedom of the Press Foundation's president.、Uh, and, and we're working on technical programs, technical projects, to make sure that journalists can do the kind of very difficult and confidential investigations that are needed、uh, to get the truth about programs、uh, that are, they have a very high public impact. Uh, but at the same time, governments around the world, whether that is、uh, the US government, the Japanese government, the Chinese government, the Russian government, or any other,、uh, they don't feel a sense of responsibility in telling the public what they're actually doing. Right. So you are trying to encourage <coughs> journalists to、um, work on difficult issues when there is a major gap between.、Um, Uh, information between what the authorities can gather and what the public or the journalists can gather? Yes, this is exactly the, the central issue.、Uh, throughout history,、uh, we've defined what the government should be、uh, and what the public should be quite differently.、Uh, when we talk about ordinary people,、uh, members of the public, we don't say、uh, that they're public citizens. We say they're private citizens.、Uh, the government is supposed to know very little about ordinary people unless they are actively criminals,、uh, unless they've gone to a court or a judge.、Uh, the police have the specific person under investigation. And at the same time, we're supposed to know a very great deal about what our government representatives are doing, which is why we call them public officials. Uh, excuse me. But we don't really hear that kind of language so much anymore. And governments、uh, seem to be actively campaigning to prevent that.、Uh, we've had in Japan just in the last year、uh, questions raised about、uh, the Japanese government's involvement in, in U.S. surveillance projects and technologies. And when evidence、uh, of this came in the newspapers、uh, through Japanese outlets and The Intercept,、uh, Japanese journalists、uh, approached the government, the ministers,、uh, people like、uh, Yoshi Hide Suga san, and they asked,、uh, you know, what, what does this mean? Are you doing this? Is this correct? And the Japanese government wouldn't even say yes or no. Instead, they、uh, tried to avoid answering the question entirely by instead saying, well, we don't know if these documents are authentic, which is, I think, disrespectful to the public. Uh, because the American government does not、uh, say these documents are inauthentic. The American government, where they originated from, accepts that these programs were unlawful in some cases,、uh, passed new legislation to change the way these programs operate, even though the reforms were very minimal. It, it wasn't enough,、uh, and the threat to rights is still very serious, even in the United States. But they were at least they accepted. Uh, the US government accepted that when journalists had evidence,、uh, when the public had enough proof that these things were beyond the point of、uh, denying them reasonably、uh, that these things were happening, that they would have that conversation.、Uh, and I think it's、uh, unfortunate the Japanese government,、uh, and this is not unique to Japan, there are many governments who do this, but the Japanese government. 
still objects uh, and says, we can't even discuss this uh, because our allies wouldn't like it or because we don't know if it's true. Uh, when these are policies that have a primary public impact, they actually change not just the laws of a, nature, of a nation, uh, but the culture of a nation. That shouldn't be a decision that's made by government. That should be a decision that's made by all of us collectively in public conversation. I wonder if you feel that the Japanese press is not scrutinizing the government strongly enough. I, I think it's understandable why uh, in Japan this is not the case. Uh, the Japanese uh, sort of media culture uh, people professionally who work uh, at Japanese news organizations understand uh, it's simply a reality that if they report too uh, aggressively on the government's activities, even if the government is legitimately breaking the law, uh, even if the government is legitimately engaged in some kind of scandal, uh, that their editor will get a phone call, that there will be some pressure, uh, that Japanese government officials will stop responding uh, to the inquiries from that media organization and give preferential out, uh, access to their competitors. Uh, and this is an intentional uh, strategic dynamic on the part of the Japanese government. Uh, I think to create a result from the Japanese media, which we see today, uh, I think it's difficult to blame any particular Japanese media organization for this outcome. Uh, but I do think uh, we can recognize that it's a very serious situation that needs a remedy. Uh, I don't believe it is okay uh, to accept that this is simply the way things are, uh, that the government will threaten the media out of reporting stories, not directly, but by structuring a system uh, in which doing your job too well is punished. And unfortunately, I think the only way to change this uh, is for the Japanese media collectively. All of the outlets, regardless of whether they are uh, the most uh, serious rivals uh, or the closest partners, have to recognize that it is important for their future as an industry that the public see them as public champions. And that's only going to happen if they protect not only their own outlets, but the other outlets around them to make sure their number one goal is always to find the truth, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's difficult for very powerful figures, uh, politically uh, or corporately, uh, and get that to the public. Uh, it has to be a team sport. Mr. Snowden, let me go back a little bit about the 13 documents that were disclosed in April. And uh, that was uh, having um, shock waves still in um, this country. And we still don't understand um, what the meaning of the facts that were disclosed in the confidential documents. And I would like to ask you, um, from your point of view as a technical expert, um, what do you say was the most significant disclosure from the 13 documents? Uh, I, I think the most important thing here is to not look uh, specifically at a document, right? Not, not look for a detail, not for a line about how, for example, uh, the US NSA is providing its top secret surveillance technology to the Japanese government in exchange for sharing of data, in exchange for sort of improved relations. Uh, this kind of trading um, happens in, in, in many places, right? Uh, we see this happen in, in Great Britain. Uh, we see this happen in Germany, in Australia, Canada, all of these places uh, where they're, they're trading information about their public, about their citizens uh, with the United States uh, in exchange for some results. Uh, because this is what intelligence agencies uh, do, right? It's not uh, necessarily explosive that this kind of activity occurs. What is important, uh, what is revelatory uh, about this is the fact that it was kept from the public because this was not necessary. Uh, if you told the Japanese public 
that they were secretly uh, supporting the U.S. intelligence network, uh, no one would be surprised, right? Uh, and there may be some objections, uh, and it may make that work a little bit more difficult, but that's not a bad thing. That's a, a good thing. Uh, Japan knows better than many other countries that when you start getting involved in military activity, uh, when you start getting involved uh, in aggressive power relationships, uh, a sort of a control dynamic where you start to project force beyond your own borders, uh, these situations can develop in ways that create large civil costs. They create costs for the public, whether we're talking financially uh, or whether we're talking about getting uh, engaged in military conflict. And it is difficult to imagine uh, an area of policy which requires more public in, uh, influence that requires more public debate than deciding where it is that we, in whatever nation we happen to be in, should set the lines of our involvement uh, in a foreign country's foreign policy, right? Uh, to simplify, what we saw in these documents uh, was a significant amount of US influence uh, in the Japanese government's activities often beyond what was authorized, uh, or at least publicly known, to be permitted by Japanese laws. And this raises a central question. Who should be deciding what it is that the Japanese government's position is uh, in a certain area? The secret agencies of the United States uh, or the general public uh, of Japan? I think there are some people who are not so well aware of what has been disclosed. And I think it would bother many, many people if um, we know that in, in the, one of the documents says that the United States provided the X key score to Japan. And uh, this is something that would allow um, ubiquitous state surveillance. You disclosed that that was happening um, in the United States citizens and all over the world, but I think it would bother the Japanese public if we, the Japanese people, were the targets of ubiquitous surveillance. And can you tell to our audiences here that what would X key score allow Japanese intelligence experts to do that they were previously unable to do if, if the government had really been um, provided the X key score by the United States. We don't know because the government doesn't okay. say. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can confirm that the Japanese government uh, has definitely received this, uh, as has many other governments. Uh -huh. uh, it's discussed in the documents. Uh, uh, did the defense, do you say the defense ministry received it? Uh, I, I don't know which particular uh, agency is uh, receiving it. I don't want to go uh, sort yeah. of make news disclosures here. Okay. Uh, just responding to what's uh, already public. But let me add one more public. question. Were, were, were sure. the X key scores provided, were they already pri provided while you were in Japan? Or was it after? Uh, this, this kind of thing happened, uh, I, I think, uh, during this whole period. It's, it's an ongoing period of negotiations, right? This isn't something where uh, sort of uh, one government asks and then immediately it appears the next day. Uh, this is a long, continuing period uh, where there are many meetings, there are many discussions. It's, there's sort of a, a process of, of horse trading or negotiations between governments about how we'll manage this, who's going to pay for it, where is it going to be located, how are you going to protect it, how are you going to deal with this. Uh, but there's a simpler way about talking, uh, or a simpler way of describing publicly uh, what we don't have documents to show, uh, disregarding the things that we do have documents to show. Uh, and this is that the Japanese government is deepening this relationship and becoming much more a, a, a much more aggressive participant uh, in this mass surveillance dynamic. Now, how do we know this, right? Uh, where does this come from? Well, if we look at the progression of very unusual, uh, unexplained legal changes uh, domestically in Japan, 
I'm talking about uh, in 2013, uh, I believe the Abe government's big push to change the state secrets law, uh, to up the penalties for revealing uh, secret information. It's always been a crime to do this in Japan. There was no real need for this. Japan uh, doesn't have some crisis uh, with people inside the government taking information and giving it uh, to the media. <coughs> Excuse me, about, uh, about these kind of uh, surveillance authorities or the military operations. It's just not a real problem. But uh, the Abe government uh, invested an incredible amount of political effort into changing these laws uh, to make the penalties much higher, to make the law much more restricted. And the question uh, to a reasonable observer on the outside would, would be, well, why? Uh, why is this so necessary? The opposition is resisting. This is unpopular with the public. There are protests in the street. Why does the other government care about this so much? Uh, and the answer is uh, because the US government requires as a condition of receiving uh, sort of a, a deeper role in this grand surveillance conspiracy. Right? I, I don't mean conspiracy in a way of UFOs and pyramids and crazy things like that. Uh, I mean a secret partnership uh, that's well known, right? They, they admit this, uh, he, even the defense secretary, uh, while he won't admit to the documents, does admit this relationship exists. Uh, the, the thing here is to gain greater trust from the US government, basically. They say, your laws have to match ours. Japan's secret laws can't be different from ours. They have to be the same. Uh, so you have to raise your penalties to meet ours. And that's what the Abe government did. Uh, now, since then, right, when we go to this year, uh, we see a similar law, right? Uh, this new conspiracy law. Uh, where the Abe government, again, over the protests of the public, over the protests of the opposition, there was no consensus, uh, either by experts uh, or by the public body at large, that this, these laws were necessary. They created a new public justification uh, for penalizing uh, and investigating things that they described as conspiracies, right? And publicly they said were about terrorism, they're about serious criminals. You know, you think about murderers, you think about kidnappers, you think about arsonists. But when you look at the law, uh, it's about things like taking plants uh, from, you know, a, a national forest reserve. And suddenly it becomes clear that this law is being passed uh, to provide some justification, some uh, sort of legal mechanism that's not publicly explained or agreed to, that the courts themselves will not understand because it was not discussed as this law uh, was being pushed through the legislative process, uh, that is used to apply these new surveillance technologies that they've been uh, gathering through trade with the United States and developing themselves domestically. Uh, they have, uh, if you want to imagine, it's, it's like a child. Uh, with a new toy, uh, but they've been told uh, they can't use it because it's against the rules. Uh, so they, they create a new set of rules so they can use the toy however they want. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's being, uh, that policy is being created in this way, uh, because again, I would argue it, it's not necessary, uh, and it has serious public costs. Uh, the public begins to become skeptical uh, of government. They begin to mistrust the government. And this, I think, is a very serious thing, particularly in the context of an Abe government, uh, because, of course, the LDP is already uh, struggling with so many uh, scandals about trust, right? Whether we're talking about Moritomo Gakuen or Kake Gakuen, uh, these things keep coming up. Why is this government hiding so much from the public at the same time that they tell the public don't worry about surveillance. Don't worry uh, about these new laws. Because if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Why don't they play by the same rules? So you, are you convinced that now that the Japanese uh, government is conducting similar mass surveillance, 
as it as the U.S. Uh, I, was doing on its people? Yeah. So, well, let, let's contextualize and go back to that initial question uh, of yours, which yeah. I don't think I, I addressed. Yeah. Uh, what were they, are well, they able to do now that they? What does this actually let them do? Mm -hmm. Right. What does X key score permit? Uh, what is X key score? Right? We hear this word X key score, X key score. Uh, even in English, uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's a code name. This is a very complex technical system uh, that's comprised of a number of other systems, but it has one primary purpose, uh, and this is to take electronic communications from uh, that are collected from various sources, whether they're uh, sort of stolen from transmissions that just go over the air, right? Uh, whether we're talking about uh, cordless phones that work over radiance, radio frequency, uh, whether we're talking about uh, satellite calls or satellite internet, right? Uh, and this goes over the air, so anybody can listen if they put an antenna in the right place. But then you have to process this into the system. Now they can do this over radio. Uh, they can do this over the landline. Right, uh, that go uh, under the ground in Tokyo, uh, that go under the sea uh, between Japan and the United States, uh, Australia, China, anyone who neighbors them, right? Uh, and basically collect the entire body of electronic communications to the maximum amount of their capacity uh, of these systems, their, their computers and servers that they have to buy and install at military bases, at telecommunications companies, and what they do is they take all of these signals that they're pulling out of the air, all of these uh, signals that they're pulling off of the cables, and they make them understandable even on the largest scale. Now, before uh, the Japanese government received this technology, uh, they had a similar struggle to, to many governments, even the United States some years ago, uh, where they go, we can only spy on people individually, right? Uh, it's very difficult to spy on uh, everyone everywhere, uh, and we're afraid we might miss something interesting. Uh, so back in the day, uh, technology and budget was a natural limitation on how much surveillance could be performed uh, in a given moment. You had to send an agent uh, outside of someone's house to, to literally place uh, an electronic tap on their phone lines. Uh, or you had to specifically go to the internet service provider, uh, the company, uh, a Yahoo or something like that, provide the name of the customer and say, I want all of this person's emails. Uh, now, what X Keyscore allows someone to do is catch everything as it's crossing the internet for everyone without having to ask for permission, without having to go to a court, technically. Policy is a different question, but technically, this is what the system allows someone to do. Uh, just gather these signals all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, throughout the year, it never stops. The instant a call is made, uh, it crosses through all of these different systems on the internet. But the moment it passes through that one point, where there is an X key score system in place, it's caught, it's captured, it's recorded, and now the government can search through it. Uh, and certainly we can all understand uh, why this might be interesting to a government, even if it's not permitted by law, and even if it is permitted by law, uh, why this is something that could be controversial. Suddenly, governments have changed because technology allows them to do something they could not do before, from, as a simple fact of reality, being forced to focus only on criminals, because that's all they had the time and money to do, to now using technology to watch everyone, everywhere. That is a significant difference, and that is really what the X -score, key score system, at its heart, is all about collecting and understanding communications from many people instead of only a few specific targets. So is it right to sort of imagine a world where um, the United States built a system that 
um, where its goal is to eliminate completely electronic privacy? Uh, so this is, it, it's a question of, is this the goal or is this the effect? If you asked the NSA, you know, if I'm, I'm the director of the NSA right now, because I've heard him talk about this a thousand times, so I know exactly what he said. Uh, you know, their goal is not to spy on ordinary people. Their goal is not to fight uh, privacy. Their goal is to keep people safe, to, to fight terrorism, or, or whatever you, you, uh, you say. You know, that's what they would say their, their goal is. But their method of achieving this has the result of precisely what you say. Any unprotected communication, uh, and, and by unprotected, I mean unencrypted communication, uh, can now be collected and understood. This is a very great danger uh, because it's not just happening in the United States. It's not just happening in Japan. It's happening in governments that you don't trust, governments that you don't agree with, right? Places like Russia, China, you know, France, Brazil, whoever uh, you are suspicious of, whoever you like, whoever you don't like, recognize that the technology is here. And even the governments, which traditionally we are taught are the defenders of human rights, are now using them to violate human rights. They say their intention is not to violate human rights. And if we're being fair, right, we would go, okay, maybe they're not intending to violate human rights. But this is the outcome. This is the result. They are removing from the public hundreds of millions and billions of people every single day, their privacy, invisibly without these people knowing about it. And all of these people never received a vote. They have no ability to go to the courts and challenge these programs because they're happening secretly. You know, they say this is important for national security, this is for defense, a thousand other reasons. But the bottom line is they have changed our world without democratic participation, without uh, democratic approval. Your um, disclosures revealed that there are different levels of information sharing among the countries, like, for example, the Five Eyes. They are completely equal partners. I would assume, that if information collection is forbidden at one country, one of the five eyes will collect information um, for the country so that they would not go against the law and then share the information. Um, Japan is not one of the five eyes. There is an indication in one of the 13 documents that Japan received a program on the third version third-party version. And uh, does it mean that Japan is not receiving the um, sort of the most advanced programs? We only receive the third-party version. <laughs> so there is a limit on what Japan um, has obtained. I mean, it, what, what is the third-party version exactly? Yeah, so the idea when we, just for the, the audience who may not have read all of these documents, uh, the U.S. government uh, within the NSA uh, describes uh, its relationship with partners in three ways. The first party is themselves, the NSA. The second party, uh, it's uh, a, sort of a little bit racist, but it's just the way it is, are only other English-speaking countries uh, that are... Uh, basically majority white and sort of an equal uh, traditional culture. Uh, this is Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Great Britain, and the United States. Uh, again, they don't refer to themselves as the second party. Uh, the U.S. doesn't, but Great Britain will say second party referring to the U.S. Uh, so second party is these five countries. And then third party is everybody else. Right? Uh, now, there have been third party countries that don't speak English who have tried to become second party countries. And they've gone, we are the best allies of the United States. Uh, we always support you. Uh, you know, will you make us a second party partner? 
Uh, Germany was the most recent public example. Uh, and the United States said, mm, no. Uh, despite the fact that we're so close, despite the fact that we rely on you, we're just not going to do it. And they never explain why, uh, publicly or secretly. Um, but the reality is second party uh, partners are, are all Anglophone countries and very likely to always be Anglophone countries. Um, but this uh, sort of raises the question of, okay, what's the difference between a second party relationship and a third party relationship? Well, second party partners are, uh, as you say, nearly equal. Uh, to the U.S., uh, or equal with each other. They're not truly equal, uh, because in all of their agreements they have a clause that say, this is not a legally binding agreement. If we want to break these rules, we can break these rules. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, uh, in ordinary activities, uh, we will respect these rules. Uh, we're not going to um, uh, sort of target you aggressively. We will share everything that we get that we think would be interesting to you with you. We'll even share things that we don't think are interesting with you, with you anyway, just because maybe they'll be interesting to you in a way that we didn't know about. So this relationship is very close. They basically provide everything to each other. And then we get into third party, right? Uh, second party gets almost exactly the same technology as it. Say. Uh, there are very few things that are not uh, involved in there, uh, but these are, it's quite unusual for these to matter. For the day to day operations, they're functionally identical. Third party relationships are not the same uh, because the NSA says we don't really trust these countries to be with us forever. Uh, we don't know if they'll change their position on us in 10 years, in 30 years. We have to keep them from knowing what we are truly capable of. So they will share with them only parts of a specific technology, which in the case of X-Keystore is still extraordinarily powerful. So this country that they're sharing it with is very happy regardless. But this country does not understand, they're not being told, that there's this whole other power that's available to the NSA, for example, that the NSA doesn't let this country even know exists because uh, the NSA feels a need to maintain a, a level of superiority over these third party partners because to them, they're not as close, they're not as trustworthy. But this is, uh, again, where we say, where I say it's a little bit un unusual. I, I don't mean racist uh, in a specific sense, where they go, oh, we don't like the Japanese. Uh, it's more that they're not like us, right? They aren't us. Uh, if you ask an American and a Canadian, uh, you know, who are both spies, what the difference between them is, they'll say not much. We're, we're basically on the same team. But if you ask an American spy and a Japanese spy, you know, like, what's the difference? The Japanese spy might go, oh, well, you know, we work very closely with them, we do whatever. And the American spy would say, yeah, we work very closely with them, we, we do whatever. But they're not us, right? Uh, we, we can't bring them all the way in. And it's because of that cultural identity, that linguistic identity, uh, that sort of phase of separation that means even though, in reality, uh, Japan has probably been one of the single greatest allies of the United States uh, in the last century, uh, since, since the war, uh, they will never be truly trusted with an equal level of uh, sort of responsibility, uh, or responsibility is not quite the right word, but let's put it this way. The Japanese military, uh, the Japanese intelligence services will do literally anything that the United States government demands uh, because the value of the US military relationship to these Japanese organizations is so valuable. It, there's an imbalance of power. Whereas on the US side, if the Japanese government demanded something of the United States government, they would go, oh, of course, we'll, we'll try to help you. Uh, we'll, we'll do this. But will the United States uh, truly risk everything uh, in the other direction in that relationship? 
And it's not clear that that's the case, particularly under this new president, uh, who is called into question the level of obligation that he feels to traditional allies who have been, uh, shall we say, very responsible towards the United States over the past decades. Um, what you said about not being totally equal, also what was surprising or shocking to see in the Oliver Stone movie, in which um, Oliver Stone says he interviewed you nine times to make the film. And in the film, there is a, um, a scene where um, Japanese infrastructure has been taken hostage by malware implanted by the United States. Should Japan um, go against do something against the alliance, Japan-US alliance, they can um, activate the malware and create uh, havoc in our infrastructure. Is that really true? I mean, it was just a uh, sort of a theatrical kind yeah. of a... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this program has not been uh, sort of publicly reported in depth. Uh, but uh, for this reason, I won't speak to it here because I make sure that I never make public disclosures oh. mm -hmm. uh, from the first instance, speaking extemporaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, the are things uh, that there is now public evidence of. I always let journalists mm -hmm. uh, make the decision about should the public know about this program? What parts of this mm -hmm. should they know? Uh, what parts should be kept secret? Uh, but. <clears throat> um, but the interesting thing uh, about this dynamic, right, uh, the idea, is the US government, is the NSA hacking Japanese computers, right. infecting them with implants that let them control these computers, uh, spy on these computers, do damage to these computers, even though Japan is such a good ally? Uh, and the answer, of course, to this is, is yes. Uh, there was a series of uh, intelligence releases that did not come from me. Uh, they came from a group called the Shadow Brokers, uh, who it's still unidentified who they were. Uh, but they got an incredible amount uh, of information, NSA's actual hacking tools, uh, records from the NSA's sort of internal network. <laughs> it looks like this came from uh, sort of an insider. Uh, initially, uh, when this came forward, uh, the timing of it was so weird, uh, the quality of the information was so weird, I thought it was actually the Russians. And I said this publicly. But since then, uh, so much has come out uh, that it doesn't seem to have been possible that this could have come from an external attacker. Uh, this would have had to have come from someone internal to the network. Uh, and so with this, uh, they revealed, uh, they basically published uh, all of this information that they had stolen uh, on a rolling basis, months after months after months. But if you look at uh, one of the Shadow Brokers releases, Shadow Brokers is the name of the group, uh, they released a list of machines that had been hacked using this. And there were Japanese IP addresses on this list, right? Uh, and they were educational institutions, I believe, uh, like universities in Japan, uh, basically, the same kind of critical infrastructure that is hacked in every other country by the NSA. And here we see Japan was treated no differently. What's interesting about this story is that it was uh, almost not reported at all. Um, because at the time, I, I think there was still some question of, uh, was this information authentic, right? And the shadow broker, brokers, unlike myself, uh, didn't come forward and say, here's who we are. Uh, there was no real proof. Uh, that this information was authentic only that it was clear that it was authentic uh, because when they started revealing NSA's attack tools, NSA panicked. Uh, they said basically uh, this is a, a crisis. You know, they started talking about this stuff in Congress. Um, and we actually saw those NSA tools uh, used earlier this year. Uh, by hackers, right? Because once they're released on the internet, uh, imagine NSA develops uh, attack tools for breaking into these computers, right? 
It doesn't matter whether you're used against the Japanese or the Russians or the Chinese or, or anybody else, right? Uh, they have tools that let them break into computers. Somebody takes them and releases them. Now those same tools can be used against anyone. So hackers used it uh, in a global ransomware attack called WannaCry. Uh, these NSA tools then that the NSA created uh, and the NSA kept secret actually ended up taking hospitals offline in the United Kingdom. Uh, they took uh, car factories offline in France. They took Maersk, a global shipping company, uh, offline for a few days. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was a crisis, right? And this was a very big controversy in the United States. But they never really, no one did the investigative reporting to follow up on this Japanese connection where they had also revealed uh, that these kind of tools were being used against the Japanese. And so this begs the question, of course, why is this being done? And this, unfortunately, is a question that has not been asked of government in a way that government felt forced to give a real response. Mm. So I think the latest threat, I mean, the most um, concerning threat now is cyber war. And uh, we hear about uh, cyber attacks. I mean, you've talk, just talked about them, but uh, between the states, China, in the United States, maybe North Korea, against North Korea. How severe and how threatening are the cyber wars that are under, be, being undertaken right now? I mean, we can't feel them. It's, it's hard for us to understand the extent and the severity of it. How scared should we become? I think the important thing uh, first is not to panic. Um, whenever there's some new threat, Governments always say, uh, this is a crisis like none we've ever seen. This is the greatest danger we've ever faced. And because of this, you need to give us new powers, new laws, you need a bigger budget. Uh, it's always the same. Uh, and don't get me wrong, uh, this uh, computer security problem is very serious. Uh, I will actually uh, agree uh, that computer security is the greatest national security crisis uh, that we see in the world. It is more important than terrorism, right? Uh, but it is not the end of the world. Uh, we saw just earlier this year that the most advanced intelligence agency in the NS or in the world, the U.S. National Security Agency, their best tools that attack any computer basically running Windows, uh, which is the vast majority of them used in offices and things like that, uh, could be taken by hackers. Uh, and adapted and used in the most malicious way. And it was a serious problem. Uh, again, uh, there were hospitals that weren't able to perform their business. But the world did not end. Uh, within a few days, uh, the problem was resolved. Uh, people applied fixes and security patches to make sure this couldn't happen again. Uh, so we need to keep this in context. This is a serious problem, uh, but it's not the end of the world. What we need to be thinking of is how do we make it better? And how did we arrive in a situation, in a moment, where it is such a serious problem? We have known that computers could be hacked for decades, right? Uh, we have known this is a serious danger for a very long time. This is not new. So why is it the government in, in every country, right, not talking about the Japanese government, not talking about the U.S. government, why is it the governments have not acted uh, to try and resolve this uh, for so many years? And the answer uh, is quite sad, I think. There was a uh, U.N. report, uh, perhaps David Kay can, can speak to this a little bit later, uh, that uh, described a dynamic where it's actually the most advanced government, or most advanced governments in the hacking, in the arena of hacking, right? The governments that have the most powerful secret services that are trying to prevent changes in the way hacking can be done. Because from their position, from the position of spy agencies uh, that are advanced, they go, we're better at this than anybody else. 
So, this, this moment won't necessarily last forever. But right now, we have a golden window where our opponents are, are not very good with computers. Let's think of it that way. Whereas we are very good with computers. So we want to stretch this window as far as possible to be able to attack, to attack, to attack, until our opponents become very sophisticated at using uh, computer security to achieve their goals, right? Until they become hackers that are just as talented as we are. And then, and only then, will we start trying to create new laws, new restrictions to prevent this occurring. Uh, but the hospital attacks earlier this year are, I think, the best example we've ever had for why this thinking is a problem. See, when you're developing a digital weapon, right, uh, when uh, the NSA is creating a new attack tool, uh, in, in technical language, this is called an exploit. Uh, when they create a new software exploit to attack Windows computers, to attack iPhones, uh, to attack sort of the, the systems that connect the internet together, all of these different methods of attacking someone. The problem is this. Everyone in the world is using the same software. So if you create a weakness uh, in the iPhone, or you find a weakness in the iPhone that lets you break into any iPhone in the world, intelligence agencies will go, this is amazing, this is a gift, we'll keep it, We'll keep it secret. We're not going to tell Apple about it. Even though this means if an enemy country, right, if a competitor, if an adversary, if a rival discovers this same flaw, they can break into any iPhone in the United States, any iPhone in Japan. And this is the way it works today. Now, here's where it goes out of control. We like to think about this in the context of traditional weapons. Right, uh, Defenders of these hacking programs go, well, if we stopped doing this, it would be the same as what they describe as unilateral disarmament. Our enemies would keep hacking, but, but we wouldn't be hacking. First off, nobody proposes that. Nobody says governments shouldn't hack at all. We say they should use these tools only when they're absolutely necessary and only for a limited period of time. Uh, because once you hack a phone uh, for one moment, you stay on that phone forever, basically. You can leave uh, a, a little program behind that lets you back in. It, it's like creating a second key to someone's home. Uh, the lock only keeps you out until you can copy the key. Uh, and I apologize, I know this is complicated, but I, I think it's an important uh, point to make. These attack tools, these digital weapons, are not like missiles, where you fire it and then it breaks. It can't be used. Every time you use a digital weapon, it's just code, right? Every time you use a software exploit against the Chinese, they have a chance to catch that code when it comes to them and make a copy of it. This is like a missile that you shoot at someone and then they can immediately fire the same thing back at you. The only thing uh, that lets these agencies basically justify doing this is they say, well, we think the Chinese aren't good enough to catch the missile, right, and throw it back at us. And then they can, again, because it's digital code, they can copy it an unlimited number of times. You can take one missile and turn it into 10 million. Uh, a better way of looking at this is that uh, the cybersecurity problem uh, and sort of this new digital arms industry where there are all these private companies that are creating software exploits to sell to governments uh, is more like, more like biological warfare than, than traditional warfare. They're like germs, right? Uh, they infect many people. As long as you can get that cell, that virus, the first time, you can copy it in an unlimited amount of times. And just as uh, that biological weapon can kill people in other countries, 
It can kill your own people just as easily. Uh, this is a public danger, and there's no real publicly justifiable uh, basis for permitting this to operate on national security grounds. Uh, so government develops exploits in-house. They immediately use them only against the highest priority targets. Uh, and then they immediately, uh, within 30 days, 90 days, tell the creator of the software, right? This would be Apple or Microsoft. We found this weakness in your system. You need to close the hole in this system so that when it is discovered very shortly, but likely not within 30 to 90 days, uh, we will be protected. Ordinary people around the world will be protected. The only people who suffered as a consequence of this computer security problem were legitimate national security targets, right? Terrorists whose hacking had been authorized by a court uh, and, and things like that. Um, there's so much I want to ask and I'm running out of time, but I think I should go back to our own concerns about regaining online privacy. I think more and more people who feel insecure or maybe feel that the danger of um, national threat uh, rising and terrorism, they may become more lenient about allowing governments to look into their records, saying, oh, if it's for security or if it's for safety, we may become, we, may, we should allow it. But I wonder what should be, how, should, how we can really um, gain back our online privacy. Of, can we restrict areas of surveillance or create methods for um, oversight and control as a reality, or is it everything is out of our hands? I mean, is, it, is there a way we can restrict the government? Yeah, this is, um, this is a very good question. It's a very complicated question. Uh, hopefully others in the room will have more to say afterwards, uh, because we don't have time to do it real justice. But I, I think the central requirement for tackling this problem is to recognize that it's not just about surveillance. This is about the way that governments operate uh, and the way that they exploit the natural reaction of human fear to an unpredictable world, uh, right, in which there are some dangers. Uh, everybody wants to believe uh, in this uh, imaginary bargain that governments offer, right? If you let us do whatever we want, we will keep you perfectly safe. But we know that that doesn't actually work. Uh, governments around the world, from the most authoritarian police state uh, to the most blissful uh, civil rights and human rights respecting governments uh, in the world, they still have crime, right? Uh, these are, the world will always have some danger in it. The question is, what is the appropriate level of response? And how do we manage the dangers? How do we mitigate the risks faced by the public without empowering governments so much uh, that they can cause the, the great problems and human rights abuses that they have in the past? For example, when we think about this response to fear, right, where, where people feel there's terrorism in the world, there's danger in the world, uh, so we need to be safe, so we need to do something that violates human rights. Uh, the United States is no stranger to this. If you remember in World War II, uh, Japanese Americans were rounded up and they were forced into internment camps because they thought maybe they were enemy spies. Uh, now, of course, not every Japanese person was a spy, but that's just how they responded. And even though the, the general public likely knew this was wrong, they went along with it because it made them feel safe. The government is doing uh, something similar today, not interning people, right? But they're arguing the world is dangerous. And so we need to start breaking the rules. We need to start violating the human right to privacy. Uh, and if you don't let us do this, you will die. 
There will be terrorists in your midst, spies within your midst, saboteurs within your midst. Um, and the question is, uh, okay, if that's the case, how do we deal with this? Well, there are, there are two approaches, uh, and I think one will be much more popular with this particular audience in the room than the other. Uh, one is institutions, uh, and this would be the, the fine people that we have with us today. Uh, we need a, a Japanese civil liberties union, like we have an American civil liberties union, that is very powerful. That the government is afraid of seeing in court. Uh, because what they do is they create a natural safeguard, a natural friction on the government. Where even before a policy is made, even before the law is broken, uh, in that shadowy room that has uh, you know, Japanese cabinet ministries sitting around going, well, we have this new technical ability to let us spy on everyone. Should we do it? We need someone in that meeting to be afraid of what civil society institutions in Japan are going to do about it when they find out. And we need people in that room to be afraid that the Japanese media will discover it very quickly and they won't be afraid to tell the public about it. Because this is the way that you get good government, right? Uh, accountable government is the only government that you can trust. If government officials feel like they can get away with things without anybody knowing about it, they're very likely to do so. Again, we see this not in the context of terrorism, but in the most simple, ordinary, day-to-day -day corruption that you see with like this Moritomo Gakuen uh, kind of scandal, where they go, oh, you know, I'll do a favor for my wife. Oh, I'll do a favor for my friend. Let's open a veterinary school. Let's, you know, uh, make the permits a little bit easier because no one will find out. So we need strong institutions the government is afraid of. The second angle of it, which is more radical uh, and also more difficult, but ultimately more powerful, uh, however it's more unpredictable because of this, is if we as a public recognize that governments around the world, both good governments and bad governments, neither of them are respecting our right to privacy, we can start to use science and technology to remove their ability to interfere with them. Now this is the idea of well, how does hacking work? How does surveillance work? Uh, it only works because communications today are insecure. As a general rule, there are some secure communications, uh, but they're very rare. Right? Systems, as a general rule today, are insecure. It's very easy to break into computers. It's very easy to break into phones if you have a budget that's hundreds of millions or billions of dollars a year. But what if we change that? What if our engineering, which always gets better year by year, makes computers safer, just as cars become safer uh, over the last century? What if we make the digital communications that wash over the world today secure by default, without requiring you to use a special technology, without requiring you to have any special knowledge, uh, what this does, uh, in its ultimate result, is it goes, we're removing from government the ability to interfere in these areas of private life uh, that they have shown they are not willing uh, to respect. When they break the rules, uh, we will work to create methods of stopping them from ever doing it again instead of trying to punish them and hold them accountable. It's difficult, and as of today, there is no such thing as a perfectly secure system, but that doesn't mean there will never be. I'm running out of time, and my last question, do you wish more whistleblowers to come out, and what is going to be your role from now on? Yeah, so for, for me, my, my role now is I, I try not to be uh, sort of uh, 
involved in the political back and forth because it's, it's not my background, it's not my training. I'm an engineer, right? Uh, just giving these talks is, is quite difficult for me. It's, it's taken me a lot of practice. Uh, but as an engineer, this second part that we described before uh, of making sure there can be secure communication, at least in some area, at least where it really matters, uh, that's the kind of thing that I spend my day-to-day -day work on today. At the Freedom of the Press Foundation, we see in the United States, uh, the new Trump administration uh, is a great enemy of journalism. Uh, they say that newspapers are the enemy of the people, crazy language that we haven't heard from for a generation. Uh, and so how do we make sure that even journalists that are being targeted, even uh, intelligence agency employees who see some criminal activity happening, or even not in an intelligence agency, right, but in some powerful company, uh, who know there will be some retaliation if they reveal this criminal activity, how can we make sure that they can reach journalists, talk to them privately, tell them the truth, and that journalists will be able to go through the publication process to get this information back to the public uh, in a manner that's safe and ultimately benefits the public. Uh, it's a difficult challenge but this is my primary focus today, uh, and I've got to say it's quite difficult. Uh, keeping communication secure today, uh, keeping computers secure today, is an unsolved problem, uh, but I think it's one of the most important that we face in our time. Mr. Snowden, thank you so much for joining us today. Arigato. Arigato. Arigato.